Okay, a very good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us today evening uh, interactive Bible study. To Just to start before me, I request Pastor Dan to submit rest of the session into prayer. Sure, let's pray then. Loving gracious Father, it's a privilege to be able, Father, to gather together and we do it in your name. We do it in the grace of and the blessings that you grant us uh, as we put our hearts to learning more, and growing in knowledge, especially of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask a very special blessing that we are committed to growing. We are uh, constantly looking, Father, to enrich ourselves in the faith so that our faith grows. So we ask that you will be with Sachin and Praveen as they anchor these uh, uh, this uh, meeting today and pray that your blessings be upon them and help us, Father, to be benefit from this discussion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Dan. Uh, and a very good evening to everyone. As, as you have seen on our WhatsApp group, that today uh, we are um, tackling a different subject than we normally, uh, the series that we are carrying. And the reason for that being is that because we are in the season of Lent, or as GCI call it, the season of Easter preparation. And as you know that uh, since last Friday, every Friday in GCI Hyderabad, we have a session of prayer uh, where we come together, pray together during this season. And then we said to ourselves, why not bring a Bible study on this subject? Uh, on this vast subject of the season of Lent and, and see what it means, what are the origins, how it is uh, you know, practiced uh, in different uh, denomination, what does uh, GCI view uh, on this subject and how we as an individual uh, can take it forward. And so myself and Praveen, we work together uh, to bring this study to you. The flow of this study would be I would uh, lead the study and then Praveen will join in wherever he uh, he would feel necessary to come in. And once the study is over, then we'll go into clarification, question and answers. So to start, let me share my screen and then we can start. I hope you can see my screen. Perfect. So let us today learn together about what is this season of Lent. So if I have to give you an overview of Lent, basically Lent is a significant period in the Christian liturgical calendar and is observed by many denominations including Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Anglic uh, Anglicanism, Lutheranism, and also some Protestant denomination. It spans 40 days leading to the Easter Sundays, excluding the Sundays in between, and it begins with Ash Wednesday. Now, the season of Lent, basically it commemorates the 40 days that Jesus spent fasting in the wilderness as recounted in the gospel of Matthew. We read it in chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. In the gospel of Mark, as we read it in chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. And we also read it in the gospel of Luke in chapter 4, verse 1 to 13. Now let's see what is the history of this Lent, how this word came into practice, how the practices got associated with the Lent. Now, Lent is an old and long tradition that is estimated to have began a few centuries after the death of Jesus Christ in 29 AD. It started much early. Early Christians started to observe that as a society of that time, they believed that 
it was important to honor the crucial day of Jesus Christ's resurrection through the special spiritual preparation. Now, one of the earliest explicit references to this period of fasting and preparation of Easter come from the writing of 2nd century bishop and theologian Iranius. And in his work Against Heresies, which was written around 180 AD. And here, Iranius mentions a period of preparation for Easter. Though he doesn't specify the duration or the exact practices that were involved. But he talked about the preparation. Now, the second early reference we see to a period of fasting before Easter come from the writing of the 2nd century bishop and martyr Polycarp of Smyrna, where he has written uh, his letter to Philippines, uh, Philippians at around 150 AD. Here, Polycarp referenced the practice of fasting before Easter as a tradition that was already established in the Christian community. So he mentioned a practice which was already established during that time. Now, by the 4th century, Lent has become more formalized. Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Now, all of us know uh, Council of, uh, all of us know Nicene Creed, right? Which is most of the churches after the sermon we read. Uh, we also in GCI uh, believe in the Nicene Creed. So this is the same uh, uh, Council of Nicene. So now, here, the council also issued 20 canon of practical nature. So they, they release 20 canon of practical nature dealing with various aspects of church life. And the fifth of these canon speak about Lent. So out of the 20, canal, uh, um, 20 canons that was released by the Council of Anesia, the fifth canon talks about Lent. Now the word used for Lent in the fifth canon is the Greek word called as tesserakona, tesserakona, which means 40. Yeah. Now for the first time record in the recorded history, we have a mention of the period of preparation for Easter as lasting for 40 days, which is where in the fifth canon or uh, canon of the Council of Nicaea. Now, much earlier than this, Christians had introduced Easter Sunday to celebrate Christ's resurrection. And soon afterward, uh, they have added a period of two to three days of preparation, especially commemorating Christ's passion and death, and which the Holy Week, which is now a part of Lent today. Now, this practice has been adopted by many various Christian communities during that time. But the first mention of a preparatory period that is lasting for 40 days come from the fifth canon of Nicaea. And now how did this 40 days come into uh, picture? The length of the time was adopted in imitation of the 40 days that Jesus spent in the desert in the beginning of his public ministry. As we read it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, and, and it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. So the reference of 40 days come from Christ's fasting of 40 days and 40 nights. Now, <clears throat> at that time of the Council of Nicaea, which was, 325 AD, remember the church was united. That means the East and West church was one. That means 
it was much before the sad division of churches church into catholics and orthodox which came about in the 11th century okay so the reference to lent reference to spirit uh, easter spiritual preparation goes much much before even before the catholics uh, church separated from one church which happened in the 11th century now now that we know how lent came into picture what was the history let's see some of the practices that we follow during the lent now the first is ash wednesday now this marks the beginning of the season of lent it is the day of repentance and reflection symbolized by the imposition of ashes on the forehead of the believers in the shape of cross now the act represent morality humility and the desire for forgiveness now this ashes are typically made from the burning of the palm leaves the practice of using the ashes as a sign of penitence it goes way way back to the ancient time as we read it and as it was mentioned in the book of job in job chapter 42 verse 6 then the second thing is fasting and abstinence what happens during lent many christians engage in fasting and abstinence as a form of spiritual discipline now fasting often involve abstaining from certain type of food or meal while abstinence may involve refraining from particular activities of or particular luxuries now these practices is rooted in the biblical tradition of self denience and penance now where do we see this in the new testament jesus speak about fasting in matthew chapter 6 verse 16 to 18 emphasizing the importance of sincerity and humility in one's fasting practices the next practice that is followed during the lent season is prayer and reflection now lent is also a time for increase prayer introspection and spiritual growth many churches offer special services such as the station of the cross where believer reflect on the passion and suffering of jesus it is also a period of deepening one's relationship with god and seek spiritual renewal in matthew chapter 6 verses 6 jesus teaches about the importance of prayer encourage the believers to pray in private as a means of connecting with god authentically now as i am telling you about the practices of lent is what i am telling you is how it is being followed in different denominations okay the the fourth practice is alms giving and acts of charity now another as essential aspect of lent is alms giving which involves act of charity and generosity towards those in need now this practice aligned with the biblical emphasis of caring for the marginalized and practicing love and compassion towards others in matthew chapter 25 verse 35 and 36 jesus instruct his follower to feed the hungry clothe the naked care for the sick and imprisoned one emphasizing the importance of serving others with kindness and generosity that is about alms giving and acts of charity then the next practice that is followed is lantern devotions that is lent devotion now throughout the season of lent many christians engage in specific devotional practices to deepen their spiritual journey now this may include reading the bible daily participating in the lantern study group or retreats or incorporating additional prayer uh, discipline into their routine and what is the goal the goal is to draw closer to god and grow in faith during this sacred season we see in psalm chapter 51 verse 10 
King David prays for a clean heart and a renewed spirit, expressing a desire for spiritual transformation and intimacy with God. And then it followed with the Holy Week. Now, the culmination of the season of Lent is the Holy Week, which begins with Palm Sunday, that is commemorating Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem and ends with Easter Sunday, celebrating Jesus Christ's resurrection. Holy Thursday, or we call it Maundy Thursday, remembers Last Supper. Good Friday focuses on the crucifixion and the Holy Saturday is a time of reflection and anticipation before the Easter Sunday. Now, these events are central to the Christian faith, reminding the believers of the redemptive sacrifice and victory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 4, Apostle Paul emphasized the significance of Christ's death and resurrection for the forgiveness and sin and the hope of eternal life. Now, this is about the practices that are generally followed during the season of Lent. Now, how does GCI look at the season of Lent? The first thing is, GCI prefers calling the season as a season of Easter uh, preparation, as a spiritual preparation to celebrate the resurrection day of our Lord Jesus Christ. GCI worship calendar also includes the season of Easter preparation, as we can see here. So we see that there is a preparation for Easter, which begins with Ash Wednesday, continues through uh, until Holy, Holy Saturday. Then we have the Holy Week, which is, uh, we have the first is the Palm Sunday, which is Jesus' triumphal entry. Monday, Thursday, it's the Last Supper with the disciple where Jesus gives the new commandment to love as he loves and the promise of the Holy Spirit. Good Friday, that's Jesus' death and burial. Holy Saturday as a day of reflection and then reaches Easter Sunday, which is the beginning, uh, which is the celebration of Christ's resurrection. Now here, one thing to remember that GCI worship calendar is informed by GCI theology. And our intention here is to rehearse and celebrate the salvific, which is salvation specific events of Jesus Christ. GCI believes in rehearsing and celebrating the salvation specific events of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, there are some questions then related to Lent that comes to all of our mind. And they are, do we observe these practices during this season? Then somebody will ask, are these practices only to be followed during this season? What about rest of the season? Let me try and answer those. You know, uh, <clears throat> the answer to the first question is, it is up to you. Would you like to observe these practices during this season? It is up to you. And the continuation of this answer, I will cover it in answer of question two. The answer to second question is that the practices that are shared during the Lent season are the very practices that define our lifestyle. Just, just sit, sit back and, and, and think about this. All these practices that we talk actually define our lifestyle. They don't need to be practiced only in one season, but they need to be practiced in every moment and every day of our life, reflecting Jesus as the center of all we do. If you, if you go back and see all the practices, something that out of reverence and response to who God is as revealed in Christ, as we understood by the Spirit, all these practices are part of our daily life. So whether we practice during this season or whether we practice in other season, I think it has to be practiced every day of our life. Now, that is the practice of prayer, practice of reflection, 
practice of fasting, helping other are the very characteristics of the children of God. And this is the very reflection of our life of union and communion with God. This reflects our relationship with God. But remember, there is a very thin, fine line of how we should practice or celebrate these practices. Now, all the spiritual practices that we have discussed, and, and I have re referred it here, uh, all these are perfectly fine to observe. But we need to be careful while observing these practices. And why I'm saying that? Because our goal must be to point all of our practices to Jesus. It has to focus towards Jesus. He must be the focus of anything and everything that we do. And in doing anything and everything, he must be the sole focus of our worship. We cannot move from our Jesus. So when we practice this uh, thing, the focus should not be on us, but instead it has to be on Jesus. Now, as many Christians around the world observe these spiritual practices, the focus is often moved from Christ to their own act. Because often we think our effort or other people who, who are celebrating the season of Lent and practicing these spiritual practices, they often feel that our effort to be holy during these periods, our act to give up something, our effort to give up something, or our effort to help only during this season may make us justified with for what Christ has done for us. And that, my dear brother and sister, is a source of all problem. Because None of our act should be performed in order to make efforts to be justified to receive his grace and work toward our salvation. We cannot do anything and we should not do anything in order to justify to receive his grace or in order to justify ourselves to be part of the uh, greater salvation plan. Why? Because according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, Apostle Paul says, Grace is a gift from God that saves us through faith. It is a free gift that cannot be earned or taken away. Now, grace is not only a gift for salvation, but it is also a gift that motivates us to do what God has created us to do. That is to reflect the very image in which we are created. Now one would normally ask this question that if I cannot earn the grace and if I cannot earn the salvation which is not dependent on my work, then why do I need to do anything at all? Why do I need to do? And I would like to answer that question in this way. There can be only two types of responses to God when he revealed himself to us through Christ and as we understand by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the first response is always a response in worshipping him as we are united with him with a life of union and communion with him. So first response is in worship to who he is and to who he is revealed to us. And then what we do? We participate with him in what he is doing in the world, in our neighborhood, in our society, in the lives of our, our loved ones. And what we do? We participate by reflecting in the same love that we have received from God. That's the first response. The second response is that we reject God's offer of being united with him in the life of union and communion with him through Christ by the Spirit. We reject. It, there can be only two uh, response. Either we, uh, we respond or we reject. Now, God's grace and his offer of our redemption is like a sunlight that falls on everyone. God's grace and his offer of redemption is like a sunlight that falls on everyone. Some accept and enjoy the fullness of life in union and communion with God. Some who reject this offer says 
we would rather stay in darkness that than receiving the light the light that change our life some might reject now staying in the darkness remember staying in the darkness only bring suffering and destruction staying in the darkness only bring suffering and destruction now this suffering and destruction are not is not god's punishment for not accepting the offer of redemption no but rather it is us who rejecting the offer and submitting ourselves to the kingship of satan who offer us nothing than suffering and destruction satan cannot offer us life but always remember that god does not want anybody to lose this offer this offer of redemption he does not want anybody to lose which he has offered to us through christ finished work on the cross in fact he is such a loving patient shepherd who goes out for that one lost sheep and he is such a loving caring father who continues to wait for his prodigal son to return so only a response would be to respond to him in worship and in the life of union and communion with him i uh, moved away from the lent but i wanted to bring this topic because we often feel if i am not contributor then then what am i doing and hence i thought i should um, focus this one now the next thing that comes is whenever it is about lent i heard many people saying oh we don't do like roman catholics then i thought in our study let's also see what the practice how they practice the season of lent now while the council of nicaea in ad 325 acknowledged the existence of the 40 days of lent it was the second vatican council that confirmed its importance and the 16 centuries between this two council saw a variety of development in the way christian observe this season now this vatican council was conveyed by pope john 23rd in 1962 and this uh, uh, council continued until pope uh, uh, pope paul 6 in 1965 and they brought significant changes and reforms by various aspect of the uh, various aspect of the catholic church including the liturgy and the way in which the lent is observed now while the core principle and practices of lent remain intact the vatican ii council introduced several reform aimed at renewing and revitalizing the church approach to lantern observance and here are some of the key changes that they proposed first is liturgical reform what did they do one of the most significant outcome of vatican ii was the reform of liturgy which included changes in the to the celebration of lent the council emphasized the importance of active participation by the lay people in the liturgy that is number 1 encouraging the use of english and other vernacular language instead of latin and promoting a greater understanding of the liturgical rites among the faithful so they went through the liturgical reforms the next one is simplification of rituals now vatican ii called for a simplification of liturgical rituals and a greater emphasis on pastoral significance which then led to some practices and ceremonies where they could make it more accessible and meaning to the contemporary worshipers or to the new generation of roman catholics the third one is encouragement of scripture reading now the council encourage catholics to engage more deeply with scripture both individual and as a community as a result there was a renewed emphasis on the reading and proclamation of the scripture during the lantern liturgies including the uh, introduction of scriptural reading and psalms and some of the examples that uh, they used to recite psalm in the sixth prayer that is we we see uh, morning prayer then we have praise then we have a uh, third hour after sunrise then 6 9 and the concluding prayer so this was 
this the psalm reading was used used to harmonize the lantern spirit and then they also followed reading of the scriptures from old testament and new testament uh, uh, in their masses for monday tuesday wednesday and friday so that's how they uh, encourage the scripture reading then the next is focus on spiritual renewal and social justice Vatican II emphasized the need for spiritual renewal and the active engagement of Catholics in addressing social injustice and promoting the common good. This broader understanding of Christian discipleship influenced the way Lent was observed. So this was especially more encouraged during the Lent period, which Im Im increased the emphasis on works of charity, social outreach, uh, outreach and efforts to promote justice and peace during, especially during the lantern season. And the most important is encouragement of ecumenism. Now, what is ecumenism? It's a movement of worldwide Christian unity. Another significant aspect of Vatican II was its emphasis on ecumenism and dialogue with other Christian traditions. Now, while Lent has always been observed by various Christian denominations, Vatican II's economic ecumenical approach encouraged Catholics to recognize and appreciate the lantern practices followed by other Christian communities and seek greater unity among the believers. They encouraged the unity. Now, the idea behind me for bringing this, uh, uh, how Lent is practice by the Roman Catholics and how the Council of Vatican II in 1962 to 65 has changed is to basically bring you the aspect of how it is practiced and celebrated by the Roman Catholics. The idea is not to justify something is right or wrong and we should not be the person who should justify if something is right or wrong. The idea for us to be aware how different denomination practice the season of Lent or the season of Easter preparation while we continue to confirm what we believe and that is Christ-centric, grace-based approach. In everything we do, we ensure Christ is the center of everything. Now, another thing, I'll just take another 10 more minutes and then we'll go into this, is the most common uh, discussion that we have is Easter or Resurrection Day. Why do we call it Easter Sunday? Oh, we should not call it Easter Sunday. It should be referred as Resurrection Day. And I thought, let's jump into a study and see how did Resurrection Day came to know as Easter Sunday and it's broadly been referred as a Easter Sunday. Now, the term Easter being used for the celebration of resurrection of Jesus Christ has a complex and multifaceted history, drawing from the various linguistic, culture and religious influences. You want to see? The first thing, it has the old English origin. Now, the English word Easter is believed to have its root in the old English word called as Istre or Yostre, which refers to the pagan festival dedicated to Yostre, a goddess of spring and fertility. Now, this festival was celebrated around vernal equinox in German paganism. So, during it was celebrated. And some churches suggested that the Christian celebration of the resurrection uh, day was intentionally aligned with these springtime festivities to facilitate the conversion of pagans to Christianity. This is some scholar suggest one theory. Now, second is Christian adoption. Now, early Christian did not originally use the term Easter. They always referred the celebration of Christ's resurrection. Instead, they often refer it with the Greek word Pasha, which is derived from the Hebrew word Passover. Why so? Because the connection between the resurrection and the Jewish Passover is significant as the Last Supper, uh, Jesus' crucifixion and subsequent resurrection occurred during the Passover festival. And the next one is syncretism and cultural assimilation. Now, what happened? As Christianity spread throughout Europe, it encountered various pagan customs and traditions. 
in an effort to make Christianity more accessible to pagans and ease their transition to the new faith, Christian missionaries sometimes incorporated elements of pagan festivals into Christian celebration. Now, the adoption of term Easter may have been influenced by this process of syncretism as the Christian celebration of the resurrection coincided with the existing springtime festivities. And the next is language evolution. Over time, the word Easter became firmly entrenched in the English language as the preferred term for the Christian celebration of the resurrection. While other languages such as German and Dutch, they retain their connect connection with the partial origin for the holiday. Whereas the English speaking churches continue to use Easter to refer to the celebration of Christ's resurrection. In summary for, uh, for Easter and resurrection, the history of the term Easter for the celebration of resurrection of Jesus Christ is intertwined with linguistic evolution, cultural assimilation, and the adoption of Christian practices to existing pagan customs. And despite its pagan origin, the term Easter has become firmly established in the Christian tradition and continues to be widely used to refer the central event of Christian faith. And that is why you see Easter being so widely used and referred. Well, this is about our study of Lent, its history, how it came to pass, what practices were followed, how the practices were based on which biblical practice how we should follow it, how we should make these practices as a very lifestyle to show our relationship with God. And then we also touched about Easter and Resurrection Day. So that's, let me stop my screen sharing now. So that's about the season of Lent or we call it in GCI, Easter preparation. And now, before we go into uh, comments, I would uh, give the time now for to Pastor Praveen to to add his view on the various things that I have touched. Over to you, Praveen. Thank you, Pastor Praveen. Uh, thank you, Sachin, for such a comprehensive uh, study on the season of Lent or preparation of. Uh, Easter, there are no many things for me to uh, add. You have covered uh, most of them. Uh, but there are a few things I uh, would like to just comment and then we can go for, uh, uh, we can open it, uh, open the forum for questions. Uh, first of all, we need to understand the moment we think uh, Lent, we don't need to think this is a season of uh, gloominess, but uh, on the contrary, it is a time of celebration. As Jesus said, if you fast and pray, do not show yourself as if you are fasting. But uh, if you are uh, doing makeup a little uh, on normal days, during the fasting days, you do much more. <laughs> in other words, what I meant to say is in simple words is uh, it is a time of celebration and uh, uh, it is a time of joyfulness and purification that uh, we need to understand. And uh, Lent is generally looked at as a time of reflection and repentance, as Pastor Sachin also uh, reminded us. And this particular thing is a response to the grace that we have received from God. This repentance and reflection and spiritual discipline, uh, various practices we are doing not to obtain the grace of God, but because we obtain the grace of God, as Pastor Sachin said, that these are the responses that we have. So whatever the Lent, during the Lent time we are doing, these are uh, like, you know, responding to the grace we received on which the grace will be increased. You know, the parable uh, of uh, uh, the one of the parables Jesus said about uh, the parable of talents. You know, Jesus said uh, there was a there was a man who gave five talents to somebody, two talents to somebody, one talent to one person. 
and the five ta- people person who received five multiplied it and doubled it in fact and two talent person doubled it and the one talent person who received and uh, he uh, da- he dug uh, uh, he dug and buried it and when the time come uh, when the master was taking the accounts he called him undeserving servant unfaithful servant the problem here is the man he did not understand the nature of the gift that he received from the master the talent is not just talking about some kind of skills the talent is talking about the amount the talent is such a great amount of gift that god had given what is a great amount of gift that god has given it is a grace of god he had given to us it's a love of god that he had given to us so uh, and this gift if you go and bury it it is going to be vanished that's what jesus said many times uh, uh, he who has more more will be given he who has little whatever he has also will be taken away it is not just capitalism it is the gift nature of the gift that he had given to us the grace which god had given to us so what happens is as much as we respond to this grace how do we respond as we received it we give it to others as we respond as we received it we re- respond to it in thanksgiving in a, uh, and then in repentance and in prayer uh, and kind of getting connected to god what happens is this grace will be increased much more in our lives even you can introspect your own lives you might have experienced the same as much as we focus and reflect on the grace of god you will experience it more you will receive it more and more and the moment we do, okay i received it and and you don't focus on it what happens we will lose the sense of what we have received also so this is a great opportunity and time for us where we reflect and re- re- respond to the grace that we have received that is what this lent is talking about it is a response to the grace we received and lent is also consider it can be considered as stone jars as a stone jar for our renewal and our growth a stone jar you remember in john chapter 2 the stone jars were filled with water so this see this is like a season the jars are like uh, the season and we are like the water and we submit ourselves to god and we come before god and he can transform us from water and he will he can transform us into tasty wine and here the miracle is not happening by what we are doing but the miracle is happening by the hands of god so even during this lent season as we come before god and surrender ourselves to god and present ourselves to god it is god who works in our lives to transform us and to change us and to make us uh, uh, make us useful and in fact uh, uh, he can add more value to our lives so that is this season about and in the in- ancient christian community uh, lent is a preparation for uh, baptisms also uh so especially anglicans and all they practice this very much during the lent season uh, the youth of the church and various people in the church are taught about the faith they are taught about the commandments of the lord they are taught about uh, the we all remember uh, reciting the nicene creed reciting the 10 commandments uh, regularly these 40 days we cover, we memorize and we meditate on them discussions will be there they teach us about these and then will lead us towards the baptism so this is a season where uh, uh, church your uh, church was using it to baptize people to train people about their faith and lead them towards the uh, baptism uh, this this is a time we focus more and study more about the resurrection of jesus christ uh you know this is a the, during this 40 days people focus more on the passion of jesus as pastor sachin also mentioned some people focus on the stations of the cross and in gci in hyderabad what we are going to do is we are going to focus on the passover narrative uh, so passion narratives uh in the scripture and we focus more on that meditate more on that and understand uh, the attitude of christ so that we can we may try and by the help of the holy spirit we may adapt the attitude of christ uh, in our lives so the purpose uh, of this lent is to prepare uh, the church uh, not only commemorate the passion but the uh, passion of christ and but to relate and enter into that uh, attitude of christ passion 
and uh, uh, relate and connect our lives to the resurrection of Jesus. So our focus is going to be kind of get connected to the passion and resurrection of Jesus Christ and finding ourselves in that great uh, act of Jesus Christ. That's what that that is something uh, we are going to do. And um, we are, what is the point in uh, fasting and uh, you know uh, giving up on various uh, food, various foods and various habits, but not focusing on the Lord? If you are not focusing on the Scripture, if you are not focusing of the on the virtues of the Lent, virtues of the Lent. Uh, uh, like uh, repentance, prayer, confession, penance, and good works, uh, or uh, uh, fa prayer, fasting, or uh, uh, giving alms, generosity. And these are the virtues that Lent speaks and focuses more. So if we don't focus on the virtues and the uh, reading of the scripture, and but just simply fasting and not doing anything, uh, is not going to add any value to our observance of uh, these prayers and this Lent, and it is not going to add any spiritual value also. So we should be focusing more on the uh, virtues. Because we receive the grace from God, we respond to the grace of God in these manners. These are these are the best ways where we can respond to the grace of God. So in prayer, we respond to, respond to God. By penance means confessing ourselves before God and relating, receiving and accepting the grace of God or appropriating the grace of God in our lives, doing good works because he has shown grace to us and giving alms. And these are all are the best methods, Christian disciplines through which we can respond towards the uh, grace of God. And uh, so we need to be focusing on this virtues more. There are not many things to add because Pastor Sachin, he covered all these things very uh, clearly and uh, perhaps we can open it. These are some thoughts I thought uh, I can we can uh, fill in uh, like. So we can open it for discussions. Thank you, Pastor Praveen. Uh, now we'll open for comments, observation uh, and questions as well and we'll do our best to answer. Uh, if there's something we cannot now, we'll go back, read, and bring the answer back to you all. So the floor is now open. Yes, Bertie. Uh, recording our past practices uh, uh, before uh, before the. A very significant transformation that took place in the WCG. Uh, regarding the festivals of God, you know, Passover, Days of Unleavened Bread, um, Doctrine of Baptisms, Laying on of Hands, Resurrection, uh, and uh, Judgments. Uh, those are very specific things that uh, we were focused as past you, Pastor Sachin, and as Pastor Praveen very rightly pointed out about how this period uh, is there any uh, have, are you having any difficulty um, hearing me or seeing me? Is it? I think we can hear you well, Bertie. Please continue. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, <coughs> you all emphasize, you know, how the grace of God enables us and blesses us uh, with uh, enablement and empowerment to do the things that you all have mentioned specifically around lenten period and uh, it should go all you know all year through which uh, uh, you know the graces that we receive you know even the bible emphasizes that god enables and empowers us because we are connected to christ my question is uh, do those old uh, uh, not old you could say uh, the old covenant festivals of Passover right up to the uh, judgments, uh, the great uh, white throne judgment. Uh, if we observe it, not to say it's mandatory to because now we are in Christ and we are under new covenant and we enabled in Christ, Holy Spirit empowers and blesses us all. And we all hopefully are growing in the faith and in the goodness and love and mercy of our God in our own lives appreciating and the graces that God enables us. Will that help us, the old, uh, keeping it, 
um, in, in a way, not mandatory, but uh, would help us more. Of course, now the everything is Christ-centered and everything, we give glory to Christ. We are in Christ. We are growing in Christ. The Holy Spirit empowers us in Christ. We have, uh, you know, the blessings of Christ in us. But will that all, all uh, uh, that all uh, practices of the festivals, that, uh, would it be okay to observe it without being mandatory? I think to answer that question, if I may request Pastor Dan, who has been champion in taking us through this journey, if you can shed more light, uh, because Pastor Dan, you have, uh, I think, talk a lot uh, about uh, our old festivities and what do they mean today to us. So maybe if you don't mind, if you can share with us again. I think I'll be very brief because it will need another Bible study to discuss you know, its meaning and all of that. But uh, uh, the question was, is it wrong to observe Passover, Days of Unleavened Bread and all the Old Covenant festivals? It is not wrong to observe as long as you do not think it is required of Christians to observe. And so we believe that those were shadows pointing to the reality. Now that the reality has come, which is Jesus Christ, our focus is on Jesus Christ. So that is my answer. And if I could just add, like I've always joked, and I hope you don't mind me <laughs> joking a little bit. If you want to observe the sacrifices, uh, you may do that. But let me know so that I, I bring my barbecue with, with me. <laughs> Thank you, Zacharias. Thank you. Well said and well summarized. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Anybody else with any comments and questions? You know, the silence would mean two things. Either the message received to the core of your understanding or it flew like the plane flew in top of our house. So uh, please bring in both the... Uh, your reflection, I think, would be the right way to bring in uh, in the remaining time. So the floor is open. Well, as I always say while people are thinking, maybe one question that uh, people might have, maybe you want to speak into that, and that is, you mentioned about how Easter, it, you know, the word Easter is used for the resurrection. And so some people might wonder, is it wrong then to call it Easter? And is it better to call it resurrection? Resurrection Sunday rather than Easter Sunday. While preparing the notes, I keep it as my concluding statement, and then somehow I removed it. So let me conclude it. Uh, would calling, uh, let me conclude it with a question for that, uh, to answer that with a question. Would calling the resurrection of Christ's day as Easter Sunday or resurrection day change the reality that had happened and the significance of what it is to us? If it would change the reality of what had happened, then it's we are free to choose whatever, but I believe it would not change the reality and the significance of what has happened. And so if broader churches use Easter Sunday, I think it is okay. If we refer Easter Sunday as the Resurrection Sunday of the Lord, perfect, because that's how we started our study. Many denominations celebrate this season as a season of Lent. GC, I prefer as a season of Easter preparation. I hope uh, that answers.
However, I think I was talking with Shanti in the afternoon. Sometimes some words uh, stick to a mind for a strong and a wrong reason. And if that is the hindrance uh, for you to call it a Easter Sunday, by all means, let's call it a Resurrection Sunday. Uh, for your sake, but the foundation reality does not change. Yes, Bertie. I know of one particular person, uh, I'm not generalizing it, uh, who feels that uh, should we go along with this, sorry, it's not to shake anybody. Uh, I'm not shaken by that myself personally. And I think with Zachariah, uh, we have, you know, uh, been, uh, you know, doing this pilgrimage, doing this walk with Christ for uh, a considerable period of time. But there is one person who has been a member of the church and a very committed member at that, who feels that uh, we are just going along with this. Again, I'm saying, I'm not, to, I'm not saying, Pastor, please correct me if I say, and please reassure the people, the membership. They feel that we go along with the churchianity, he calls it, and with the, some of the pagan practices appropriated uh, into Christianity. Uh, they may not be having the true spirit of God in them. <laughs> Uh, they may not be having the true Holy Spirit and be worshipping a false Jesus Christ. Ms. Zachariah must be knowing whom I am referring to. But, uh, you know, Ms. Zachariah has always taken it, at, at, you know, addressed, addressed and spoken to him. But I, again, I'm saying I'm not, please, uh, please reassure that what we're doing is right and true. But he feels that if we go along with the churchianity in general, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, with this false churches and false, even the Bible, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of warns us, cautions us of, of uh, you know, not to go in for false, uh, you know, follow the false church practices, false deceivers, that is. And uh, you may be uh, having a wrong, uh, false spirit, not the true spirit of God, uh, not the true Holy Spirit, or not having, um, what do you call that, um, not even worshipping and knowing the true Jesus Christ. And uh, would you could just maybe just touch upon that, uh, Pastor Sachin? Thank you, Bertie, for bringing that. And I think uh, we understood your question. And let me answer this way. And I think throughout the today's Bible study, one thing that we were putting it very clear. For us in GCI, our North Pole is the Jesus Christ who has revealed who God is. Our every effort, every practice is to keeping Jesus as our center. And so when it comes to churchianity or following a wrong spirit, a wrong Christ, I think we will shield ourselves because we are always pointing to that center. And the center is Christ. And as long as we are pointing at to that center, I think we are on the right path. Nevertheless, we are not saying somebody is on the wrong path. We are on the right path. Or we assure ourselves to be on the right path. Yeah. Very well. Thank you. Yes, Manoa. <laughs> Before we close, Suri Murthy, you have been very silent. <laughs> you can unmute yourself and then share your observation and then we'll move towards closure. What I feel, can you hear me? Yes, we can. What I feel is, Lent is tradition-based. Not, not scripture-based. 
Am I right? I think we have uh, today studied the practices of Lent and how they are based on which biblical uh, references. So I think, yes, it's a tradition, but those traditions we see the scriptural base to that. Now, do, do all the practices uh, are just tied to Lent, which I said, no, that's a lifestyle. And it our practices goes much more than that. And our practices reflect the true nature of our relationship with God, which means we reflect more of Christ in whose image we are created. So, yes, it goes beyond for us. The aspects, the aspects which we cover in Lent, are covered every day, whether you observe it Lent or not. Correct. If I may just add, go ahead, Rasulabu. God deals with us continuously, testing us on every point, every aspect throughout our life. Is the self. Yeah. I thought I'll just add to what you said, uh, Pastor Sachin. That is, uh, uh, we talk about tradition. Uh, tradition is okay as long as it is not against the Bible. We cannot say that everything is scripture based. There are some things the scripture doesn't talk about. But it is not necessarily wrong because it is not against scripture. And I think Pastor Sachin clearly said, uh, it is up to you whether you want to observe it in that way or not. It is, we have the freedom and the Bible gives us the freedom to observe it. If you find it uh, beneficial to your spiritual life, you may do it. If you feel it isn't, well, then it's, uh, yeah, you can take the call. I thought I'd just add that. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Dan, for that. Well, it's with three minutes past. Mr. Sanjeev Rao, or Mr. Franklin Poppins, if you have any concluding uh, comments or else we'll move towards the closure of today's Bible study. No, sir. Uh, sir, uh, no, nothing, sir. No comments. Auntie Sharda. Sarita, Joshila, thank you for your comments. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Vanessa, would you like to share any observation? Or is it fine with what we have covered? Yes, everything is fine. Well then, thank you so much. Uh, let's conclude this study with a word of prayer, submitting what we read in the hand of God so that His Holy Spirit would guide us, right? What we covered is a start and Holy Spirit will continue to reveal more and more. So join with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, it is with thanksgiving that we approach your throne with grace and gladness, O Lord. Thank you for this opportunity that we could all learn together about the season of Easter preparation or the season of Lent as is uh, known uh, throughout the world. And as we have seen the traditions, the, the practices that is followed, a lot we have seen how this has to be our lifestyle to reflect who we are in relationship to you, O Lord. And so it is our prayer that through your Holy Spirit, may you continue to um, enlarge our knowledge, grow our knowledge, O Lord God, and understanding so that we reach and we follow and we practice uh, everything that centers to you, Lord Christ. 
thank you once again for bringing uh, everyone to for today's study we submit rest of the evening and of all of us into your hand thank you once again for this privilege to come together into this fellowship oh lord I want to thank you thank you for uh, um, everyone who could join in the most precious name of jesus we pray and we believe amen <laughs>